Now we are heading towards candid and engrossing discussion on the book titled Anger Management, The Troubled Diplomatic Relationship Between India and Pakistan by Ambassador Ajay Bisaria in conversation with a senior journalist Vikram Chandra. May I request Ambassador Bisaria and Vikram Chandra onto the stage, please. is a corporate strategic advisor for several global companies and a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. In a career spanning 35 years in the Indian Foreign Service, he dealt with some of India's key economic and security relationships. He has served in various capacities in the Ministry of External Affairs, Department of Commerce and the Prime Minister's Office, where he was a key aide to Prime Minister Vajpayee from 1999 to 2004. Adding to his illustrious career and popular acclaim, he is a prolific columnist in the Times of India and the author of the acclaimed book, Anger Management, The Troubled Diplomatic Relationship Between India and Pakistan. A brief about the book. The book delves into the diplomatic rift that stemmed from the revocation of Article 370 in Jammu and Kashmir, escalating from Pulwama attack to Indian airstrikes in Balakot, and the high stakes return of captured pilot Abhinandan Varthman. The author, diplomat in Pakistan during these incidents, provides an eye-opening details. The book also elaborately shows into interactions and other key figures as they navigated the crisis. Joining Ambassador Bisaria is Vikram Chandra, a stalwart journalist and the founder of Editorji Technologies. His visionary leadership has transformed the landscape of news dissemination through Editorji, a disruptive multilingual video news platform. In his earlier avatar, he has been India's best known TV news anchors, presenting shows like The Big Fight, Nine O'Clock News, and Gadget Guru. Vikram has been named Global Leader for Tomorrow by World Economic Forum in Davos and has won Indian Television Academy Award, the Hero Honda Award for Best Anchor Person, Achievement Award for Communication, along with featuring in top 20 on the impact list of the Digital Power 100. Sir, the floor is all yours for the enlightening discussion. Thank you. That's a song. Thank you so much for that, and Ambassador Basaria, it's such a pleasure to be sitting and talking to you and uh, understanding what exactly um, the status of relations between India and Pakistan has been for the last so many decades and what it is likely to be uh, going ahead. Uh, and whether it will remain at anger management or whether something else will eventually be the destiny of it. But before I come to any of that, if I could just uh, you know, put on my journalist's hat and come to the headline item right now, which I think everyone wants to know. Pakistan mein ho kya hai? What's actually happening there right now? We're all really curious. <laughs> okay, so we, we, we start with the current and flashback. Yes, flashback. Uh, I think, uh, you know, one way of framing uh, the elections that took place in Pakistan on 8th February is that it was a battle between the old Pakistan and the new Pakistan. You know, the old Pakistan, as we know it, is the Pakistan of the Pakistani army, uh, in which the civilians uh, are coming in a merry-go-round. They are selected periodically and put as a face. Uh, for, for 30 odd years, uh, the army was the, uh, the front office face. But uh, for much of the other period, it was the, in the back office uh, with what was earlier called guided democracy and then hybrid democracy. So it was a battle in the sense that this old Pakistan uh, was contesting a new animal, which was the new Pakistan, uh, which had as its mascot uh, Imran Khan, and uh, also 
uh, what was uh, seen on the ground before the election was a coalescing of many forces, one of which was a strong anti-army sentiment for them having, uh, you know, kind of distorted Pakistan's uh, politics for so long and interfered in its economy. A huge disaffection about the economy because there was 40% inflation, uh, economy was in terrible doldrums, and a general feeling of uh, unhappiness about uh, the way elections were being rigged. So all that expressed itself on the 8th of February by this new Pakistan in a strong anti-army vote and a strong pro-Imran sympathy vote. And by most accounts, uh, this was a, probably would have been a two-thirds majority for Imran Khan had the elections not been brazenly rigged uh, in a pre-election engineering by putting him in jail, putting various uh, cases against him, putting half his party in jail, uh, snatching the election symbol uh, that Imran Khan had, the bat in a, you know, in a very illiterate country that is an important factor. And uh, but it, it all was put together, uh, but the new Pakistan uh, mounted a great challenge to the old Pakistan. But the old Pakistan has won and is winning uh, because it always wins. Uh, the only thing was this time the chinks were exposed, that it was clear that the people's will was in one direction, but uh, the army uh, wanted a different result uh, and it got the outcome exactly the way uh, it has got in, in rigged elections in the past, which means it had selected uh, a, a weak coalition comprising the PMLN and the PPP, and that is the party that is uh, now, uh, or the coalition that will now be sworn in on Sunday with uh, Shabazz Sharif as Prime Minister. But just if you look at what happened here, and then, then we will go, go back into history, it was almost interesting, you had pre-election rigging sometimes, during the election rigging sometime, and in this case, despite all of that, you actually had a situation where when the first leads came in, Imran Khan was doing really, really well. And then again, they had to tweak some buttons and pull, pull some more, uh, take some more steps to make sure that the numbers still don't add up for Imran Khan in some sense. Has that really, the extent to which then the new Pakistan voted against the Pakistani army, do you think the army's been left really weakened by this entire exercise? Well, I think the army's credibility has certainly uh, decreased, but this is not the worst moment for the army. It's faced worse, and it is confident it will consolidate and, and take over. And, you know, one way of uh, framing this election is also seeing it in the context of a couple of other elections. So the institutional memory of the army says that the only free and fair election in Pakistan's history was in 1970, December. Uh, where Yahya Khan allowed free and fair elections because he was told that uh, Bhutto would win. And uh, that didn't happen because uh, Mujibur Rahman was in jail and won. And it led to the breakup of the country eventually. So that is a, a kind of terrifying possibility because of which uh, elections are mostly rigged. In, in 1977, uh, Bhutto himself rigged the elections. Uh, all was going well until there were street protests and uh, what happened was that the army took over. Uh, a takeover now is less and less feasible because the uh, army and Pakistan have equities in the West. Uh, the IMF loans, for instance, would dry up uh, in case the army took over in a coup, in, in direct control. So it had as its model uh, the last election of 2018 where they had exactly the same template. And uh, Qureshi Saab is here. He was the election observer uh, from the Commonwealth at that point in 2018. And this is exactly what they hope to achieve because, you know, you do a great deal of uh, pre-election engineering. So Nawaz Sharif then was in jail with cases against him. And uh, the favorite horse was Imran Khan, who was being supported. And sure en enough, Imran Khan won with a little bit of nudges from the army and some post-election uh, coalition uh, building. But uh, this time around, what was different was A, uh, the army couldn't possibly have, uh, it didn't anticipate the kind of strong anti-army move, mood in the country. And uh, the reason was that they, uh, the economic uh, crisis, which is leading the poly crisis that Pakistan went through. 
that had reached very high proportions. That has become ex very acute now. And that is uh, uh, one of the reasons why uh, you know, they, they couldn't manage the result as efficiently as they normally do. And the second was the Imran factor, which is the, uh, the Imran project. Uh, you know, in a sense, the army became a victim of the success of its own project. Imran Khan became so popular, uh, uh, you know, he came on the back of the army, but became so popular, he was so charismatic, that when the army decided to divorce uh, Imran Khan, the people were not ready to uh, follow this divorce. They still supported uh, Imran Khan. So I think those couple of differences, but the, what the army wants is the 2018 model. Imran stays bottled and they get their new selected folks and the new selected folks are in power as long as they behave and if they don't, uh, who knows, Imran can be brought back. And, and otherwise Imran stays in prison for the foreseeable future. Yes, and, and the likeliest scenario is he does a deal and gets out, goes into exile to London or, or uh, you know, just changes his behavior. Now, but the army's best case scenario certainly is that uh, he changes his behavior and gets out and they run the show with the current favorites. I'm going to come back to the future in a couple of minutes, but now let's have the flashback because the way you've, you've structured this, uh, you know, this, this really excellent book of yours is you look at it decade by decade, right? Starting all the way back in 1947. So let me also go back into the history of India and Pakistan and then we'll see what the path is uh, going forward because you do have a couple of scenarios that are outlined out there. So let's flash all the way back to 1947. Um, given the fact that there was a partition and given the fact that it was a partition that was uh, a violent process, a baby section drenched in blood as it were, um, the hostility that we've seen for 70 years, if you, if you read your book, it's not crystal clear that at that time, um, would, could, could a different outcome have been possible? a more friendly relationship, a less volatile relationship, not so much enmity? Or do you think it was preordained that if you've had a partition in a manner like this, hostility and anger would be the outcome? Absolutely. You know, the initial years uh, gave the feeling that India and Pakistan had, despite a very bloody partition, reconciled to the reality and to each other. And the diplomacy of the 50s was fairly mature. And, you know, uh, at the end of it in 1960, uh, Nehru and Ayub Khan signed the Indus Waters Treaty, which holds on till today. So it was fairly mature uh, diplomacy. They had begun to recognize each other. They tried to do a new no-war pact and, and, you know, in multiple ways deal with each other. But I think what really poisoned that was the miscalculation Ayub Khan and Bhutto made in 1965 because that really poisoned the relationship. The attempt at revisionism in 1965 changed it. So really speaking, if this flawed choice was not made, I think the history could have been very different. The two countries could have learned to live with each other better. But by 1965, there had already been a certain amount of hostility and the fact that India and Pakistan were in a, in a shooting war in 47-48, that it was not necessarily something that was being visualized just a, a year or two years earlier. You also seem to indicate in your, in your book that perhaps uh, Jinnah himself was having second thoughts as to whether he, this was the right thing that he did in, in the first place. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the India's first High Commissioner, and I try, try to tell the story in this book through the eyes of the diplomats watching it, and particularly the Indian diplomat as the protagonist. So the impression that India's first High Commissioner had, Sri Prakash, sitting in Karachi, was that Jinnah was regretting um, the partition, but, or at any rate, he was pining to go back to Mumbai to the wonderful house he had built there, Jinnah House. And he hoped that somehow, uh, you know, things would take a different turn, uh, partition was done, and he could actually, actually go back. But, you know, that is part of history, that's a part of uh, debated history. But in the relationship, uh, the two countries did try to find a way forward. Nehru did go to um, Pakistan. Uh, in, um, uh, twice in this period, Pakistan's uh, leaders were called as chief guests to India's Republic Day Parade. 
In 1965, Ay Ayub Khan himself had been invited. It's just that he planned a war, so he didn't come. He sent his agriculture minister instead. But in the initial years, there was a feeling uh, among the diplomats and to an extent in the leaders as well, that we could find a way forward, uh, we could you know, coexist in some way. The other thing which I found striking in the book is that at that time itself, right at the very beginning, there was a view in the West, and especially in Britain, that Pakistan was going to be the more important country, not India. Pakistan, because of its location, because of the access, because of the great game that was playing itself out, Pakistan was a better bet, and that's why there was a certain leaning in favor of, uh, in favor of Pakistan. Now, the Pakistanis wouldn't necessarily agree with that. They say, oh, look at it, you gave good passport to India and X, Y, Z. But is that something which you think there's a fair amount of evidence for? I think uh, now uh, historians have fairly uh, established this fairly well from British archives that there was a very credible uh, strand of opinion in, in British policy makers, making circles that having a state uh, carved out of India on its western front uh, would be in uh, the interest of, uh, uh, in British interests after they left India. So divide and quit was an attractive uh, proposition. There were multiple other factors um, in play, but also there was a feeling, uh, and this was Lord Wavell and others who recorded these notes, that uh, if a friendly sort of uh, country is carved out of India to its uh, western flank, it wouldn't have uh, the Nehruvian uh, sympathy to, uh, to the communist countries. Uh, it would be a bulwark against a possible Soviet invasion of India. It would protect the oil wells of uh, West Asia and the Middle East. So there was a sense that uh, having uh, a, a country carved out of uh, India would, be, would serve the British national interest as well. The other aspect of that history which originates there as we, as we move forward is of course Kashmir, which at the end of the day is said to be the single issue which has bedeviled relations uh, from then till now. Um, to your mind, was there any other possible denouement that could have played itself out when it came to the question of Kashmir, which would not have led to the subsequent 70 years of hostility? They could certainly have been. And uh, one of those turning points came in 1960. Uh, Ayub Khan, at the height of his powers, felt that he could have a conversation on uh, Kashmir with Nehru. But Nehru, as, uh, as it was recorded in that history, shut up like a clam. He didn't want to discuss it. But, you know, I think it's a debatable proposition because right from 47, a strategic culture of revisionism seems to have seeped into Pakistan's army. So the 47-48 uh, jihad that was uh, tried uh, in, in uh, Kashmir uh, with, uh, with the Kabelis and so on, that um, seemed to seep into the Pakistan army's strategic culture. So there was this feeling that uh, a revisionist attempt to get back Kashmir must be made. The official narrative was running along with it, which was that uh, the Kashmir cause is central to Pakistan's existence, Kashmir banega Pakistan, and that Pakistan is incomplete without uh, that part of the territory. Also, the two-nation theory was very popular then, the, the feeling that uh, Hindus and Muslims were two separate nations. And that went out of the window only in 1971. But, but the earlier... Uh, Overall trend was definitely of, uh, of uh, trying a revisionist uh, aggression on Kashmir. Um, and the sense was that if too much time passed, the power differential between India and Pakistan would make it harder to get to grab Kashmir back. And therefore, uh, that window was uh, only in the mid-60s, with Nehru having died, India having lost in the 1962 war. Ayub Khan felt that was his moment. It was a miscalculation. But then to your, you, your question, the counterfactual, better leadership in Pakistan, a better understanding of this reality would not have uh, led them to try in 1965, and therefore history could have been a little different. 
So as you move, you've, you've got your decades, 47 to 57, 57 to 67, and there on. So when you're looking at the second decade now, which is that period 57 to, to, to 67, was that a period where perhaps hubris was at the maximum in, in Pakistan, a sense that they were actually stronger than India? India was a weak country for various reasons. Uh, perhaps the Chinese, the, the defeat to China, also contributed to that. And that maybe is what led to 65 and other such miscalculations. Uh, a, a sense of arrogance, a sense of misplaced hubris. Absolutely. I think uh, that is what drove it. In 1965, uh, the official narrative of, uh, of uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, reviving the Kashmir cause, plus the feeling that in, this was a weak India uh, under Shastri, uh, compared to Nehru's India, which had run for 17 years. So there was this last win this window to, to grab uh, power. And also, the decisions were made in haste. So it was a, a sort of uh, decision uh, of uh, the 1965 Operation Gibraltar in Kashmir was something that wasn't thought through uh, at great length. It was just in Ayub Khan mind uh, with a clique of people. So I, I think uh, definitely hubris, definitely a dictator at the height of his powers and not ab able to think through uh, the consequences of what he was doing. The subsequent decade would, of course, be dominated by, I guess, two factors, the Bangladesh war and India's, India's nuclear test. But the Bangladesh war in particular, uh, what to your mind really drove Pakistani thinking in that? Because surely there was, was there ever a realization that what they were doing in Bangladesh was wrong? Or was it, uh, they just felt that we have American backing and India is weak, so we'll be able to get away with it? Yeah, so I think 71 was a combination of various factors. Hubris, certainly. Ayub Khan had by then uh, disappeared. There was a sort of internal army coup and Yahya Khan takes over. And uh, this strong racism against uh, the Bengali East, against East Pakistan, and this strong, uh, you know, uh, Punjabi feeling of uh, superiority uh, in West Pakistan, I think these were some of the driving forces but also the army's brutality in the East. And it was combining with geopolitical forces because at that point, uh, the US decided to make this uh, bridge to China move, the Nixon-Kissinger move of trying to uh, woo the other Communist Party, given that they were in a Cold War with the Soviet Union. And for that, they needed Pakistan. So uh, Pakistan pretty much got a f free pass for the genocide uh, in East Pakistan. And I think, uh, uh, you know, it, it is, and I recount this in the book, uh, the finest hour for India's uh, diplomacy, India's military leadership, India's uh, political leadership, because all of it came together in and understanding this situation and then correcting it. And, uh, and that's why the focus was on East Pakistan and not on West Pakistan, on India's part. So if I could just segue for a minute from, from the history, that also was perhaps the peak of the pro-Pakistan tilt from the point of view of the United States. Although there are people who will say that the US has often continued to tilt in favor of Pakistan, turning a blind eye to the nuclear weapons, having uh, double standards when it comes to terrorism. What to your mind has really driven American thinking on Pakistan from that period onwards? You know, I, I think all through its history, Pakistan and particularly Pakistan's dictators lucked out because uh, the US was willing to pay them these geostrategic rents simply because of their strategic location. So right from the beginning, um, in, in you know, the, the late 50s, they get a secret spy base uh, in near Peshawar to spy on the S Soviet Union. That became Ayub Khan's, uh, you know, a sort of bridge to the US. Um, followed by uh, the Nixon-Kissinger move, uh, bridge to China. Uh, and um, so the US needed Pakistan for its Cold War. The US needed Pakistan for its Afghan war uh, from 79 to 89. Uh, it became the staging post for uh, the anti-Soviet jihad. And then it needed Pakistan again uh, for its great war on terror or its actions in Afghanistan from, uh, from 2001, uh, 2002 to 2021. It's only now 
that the strategic use of Pakistan's location has dried up. And only now Pakistan feels that, uh, you know, they don't have the American benevolence on them. Uh, add to this the uh, Indian pivot and, and the new relationship that India has, at least from the turn of the century. So I, I think uh, the uh, geopolitical headwinds that Pakistan had through its history, to be able to get, get away with a lot of mismanagement of its own internal systems and have dictators in place, was because the US needed uh, Pakistan for its geopolitical goals, and that reality has changed completely. Right, and perhaps changed for good. But if you return now to that process of history, the next couple of decades from, let's say, 77 to 87, maybe extending it all the way to 97, was that the period in India, Indian-Pakistani relations where the use of terror as a proxy war, the use of terror as a death by a thousand cuts, that's when that seems to have become a first unstated and then almost formally stated policy? Absolutely. I, th I think uh, in, in uh, strategic terms, uh, after the 65 and 71 wars, it became clear to Pakistan that the power differential was growing and there was no way Pakistan could triumph in a conventional war. And therefore, uh, the uh, proxy war strategies, the low-cost proxy war strategies started. Initially, right from the 70s and certainly in the 80s in Punjab, the 90s in Kashmir and the 2000s all over. And uh, India, in all these years, did not have an answer to this uh, proxy terrorism because there was no good answer in the sub-conventional space to the kind of proxy terror India was facing. Uh, in 98, both countries went nuclear. So there was parity in the nuclear side. There was a differential, a huge differential in the convention side. But there seemed to be a superiority for Pakistan in the sub-conventional proxy war space where India didn't have an answer. So one of my contentions, uh, arguments in the book is that uh, with perfect hindsight, if India had found the kind of answers that it did in 2016 and 19 of the um, surgical strikes and airstrikes, in the 80s, in the 90s, we could have perhaps, uh, uh, you know, um, checked uh, some of the terrorism that we faced uh, in, in all these decades. Let me actually take that point up, because that's a fascinating question. One is to say that could those surgical strikes have been done in the past? Um, let's remember that Pakistan is a somewhat weaker country right now without international backing. Had it been done earlier, was there the chance for an escalation? For example, before Pakistan crossed the nuclear threshold, if there had been an airstrike of some sort, prevented Pakistan from getting nuclear weapons, would that have led to all-out war and was that perhaps a better alternative than allowing Pakistan to get the nuclear weapons? You know, I, I think this can be debated and it will be debated. But um, I would certainly make the argument that with perfect hindsight, in the 80s when India faced the kind of proxy war in, in Punjab, if there had been an action of this, of this kind, it would have entered Pakistan's security calculus that there would be a cost to any proxy warfare in, in uh, Punjab or Kashmir. And therefore, they would factor in that cost to mount it, or, or even terrorism anywhere else, uh, like, for instance, in Mumbai. So I would make the argument that uh, if uh, India had attempted such strikes, you need both capacity and intent to do that. But um, if, if India had done it, um, uh, perhaps we could have obviated uh, some, some of the terrorism that we face, simply because the cost would have gone up uh, for the Pakistan army and the risk for it for escalating into a war would have been real. There would be another possible way of responding and imposing a cost and anybody's guess whether it's actually playing itself out now or not, which is to say you also have a you know, sub-war threshold where you create mischief inside Pakistan, whether it is by fomenting trouble in a place like Baluchistan, whether it is by directly targeting terrorists by, you know, what, what is the term that is used? Unknown gunmen going in and, you know, shooting various people. Uh, that's the other way of imposing a cost without the risk of a war. You know, uh, there are various ways covert, overt, uh, to deal with this situation. Uh, but 
any of these, I would argue, doesn't compare with what Pakistan did in the 80s, in the 90s, and 2000s. Uh, because this was an industrial scale operation. You know, it, it wasn't a one covert operation or a targeted killing of an individual. Uh, so this was a completely different level of operation which destabilized Punjab in the 80s. There may have been some, uh, you know, disaffection. Democracy has its disaffections. But, uh, and what happened in Kashmir, uh, the kind of destabilizing influence was huge. So I, I think the counter to that uh, certainly should have been uh, the use of kinetic force in those times. Well, um, as I said, we all, nobody knows who these unknown gunmen are, but it also seems to be happening at an industrial scale if you think of the number of people, you know, the lower levels of the Jaish or the Lashkar who've been, who mysteriously been shot dead in the last year or so. Um, but moving on, because I don't think there's any clear answer as to what's happening there. Turning to the nuclear aspect of it, next decade, uh, 1998 is of course a pivotal moment because India tested nuclear capabilities and so did Pakistan. Um, you can say it's, it, it has, in a sense, given Pakistan parity, which otherwise it would not get. Because, yes, India's got nuclear weapons, and that's a potentially useful deterrent against China. But it does give Pakistan a certain deterrent against India, which maybe it wouldn't have had right now. If it wasn't for Pakistan's nukes, I don't think anybody would be taking Pakistan at all. Not that people are taking it terribly seriously right now in any case, but they'd have taken it even less seriously if it didn't have nukes. Yes, you know, I think uh, the uh, fact of the countries going nuclear certainly changed the whole environment and, and, and the security paradigm of the relationship. Also, the global uh, attention to the relationship because now there's a lower threshold for a global uh, interest in, this, uh, in any kind of tension between India and Pakistan because it could have a nuclear dimension. But look at the way it played out. You know, uh, the understanding was that if Pakistan gets a parity that it seeks with India in the nuclear domain, it doesn't have to worry then. Uh, and there could be ways, as the US and USSR did, of mutually assured destruction to, to find ways around uh, diplomacy and, and have a sort of cold peace um, uh, in, in that background. But what happens soon after India goes nuclear, uh, both countries go nuclear, is that uh, Musharraf attempts Kargil. So uh, a huge escalatory move into Kashmir under a nuclear umbrella. Uh, so, you know, he was doing the opposite of what you would expect, that you, you don't want to escalate a nuclear situation. What happens in 2001? Again, uh, a terrorist attack uh, on India's parliament under the nuclear umbrella. So, it was seen almost by Pakistan's uh, planners or its then military planners as an umbrella under which you could do things that you otherwise would not have done because you are confident that India won't escalate. So for India, it was, uh, you know, uh, Vajpayee when, uh, in 98 was a very, uh, very conscious of his decision and was hugely responsible uh, felt that India should be a nuclear responsible country. But what uh, happened subsequently is that the red lines of both countries were clear. And I think what uh, 2016 and 19 uh, Uri and Balakot demonstrate is that India has a good measure now of uh, the red lines and the thresholds and the escalatory thresholds. So you know that a sub-conventional attack like a terrorist attack can be dealt with in the sub-conventional space without necessarily worrying about escalation suddenly because there are 44 rungs of escalation that uh, nuclear experts talk about. So, you know, you can pretty much operate on the lower rungs. That happened in, in Kargil also because, you know, the, the, the shooting war between two nuclear-armed countries didn't actually go to nuclear and then, as you said, Balakot and, 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 and you know, Uri. So, where are the risks of a nuclear exchange right now? Um, do you think, uh, is it a feasible thing or is it one of those things you file away at the back of your mind but it doesn't actually go nuclear? I mean, Russia is not using nuclear weapons in, in Ukraine despite threatening to do so. Even when it was looking as if it could be pushed back and may lose the, lose the war, it wasn't really likely to use nuclear weapons. So the threat of nuclear strikes, is it something which should be filed away? 
and not worried about until you actually have a, I don't know, jihadist takeover or something of the nukes? That's true. I think uh, the, uh, the, the current nuclear risks are very low. Uh, in this relationship, and uh, what we've uh, we've uh, understood is that in a subconventional situation, the uh, nuclear risks are next to zero. There can be some nuclear signaling. Pakistan likes to demonstrate that its nuclear thresholds are lower than it, they actually are. Uh, but uh, I think uh, there is a way to operate there. Uh, you know, in uh, in the subconventional space, in the conventional space. Uh, without escalating into the nuclear space. So I, I think both countries are fairly, uh, understand each other's nuclear thresholds and are responsible in, in that particular sense. But as you said, the nightmare scenario is an unstable Pakistan which loses control of the command and control of its uh, nuclear systems. Uh, that would be the, uh, you know, scenario to war game and worry about. Right, let, if you, let us move on to the next dec decade and if you look at 2007, you have obviously the Mumbai attacks, right, in 2008, following whatever had happened with Parliament. Um, it's interesting to compare and contrast sometimes India's response to Mumbai with what Israel has just done, uh, you know, after uh, the October 7 attacks, where India almost was somewhat was restrained, spent a lot of time building up sympathy. There was a lot of sympathy for India after Mumbai. Some would say that it helped India paint Pakistan as clearly the bad actor in all of this, and that over a long period of time has had a more detrimental effect where India is seen as a good guy and Pakistan seen as a bad guy. That's one way of looking at it. Others would say you should have had a more strong riposte uh, and you wouldn't have had you know, the next, next attacks. How do you see that? that? Uh, the way to see, I think, uh, judge uh, Mumbai 2008 is the uh, the compulsions of that time. You know, we, we have to factor those in. India had just signed uh, a new nuclear deal uh, with the US, and uh, the argument then was that India deployed diplomacy, isolated Pakistan internationally. But where I would uh, uh, end up assessing that situation is that it was an error. And I feel that after Mumbai, uh, India should have had a kinetic response because with 155 people dead, if you're not taking uh, strict action at that point in, uh, in a terrorist attack clearly coming from Pakistan, then when will you do that? So uh, of the kind that we uh, did now, uh, you know, the airstrikes or, or the surgical strikes is something I think we should have done right after Mumbai. That would have set up a credible deterrent for any kind of terrorism coming out of Pakistan. And you know, uh, the fact that Pakistan's civilian foreign minister was sitting in Delhi while the Mumbai attack was uh, happening is not good enough because, uh, I mean, is, is not good enough reason not to do it. Uh, it's true that the civilians knew nothing about it. But the fact is that the cost should have been imposed on Pakistan's army uh, for having permitted uh, an incident like that to have happened. And I think with perfect hindsight, that uh, would be my judgment of that situation. So when you look at the fact that subsequently the, the response that was there in 2016 and 19, is that message now established? So you're not likely to see another major terror attack in India because the Pakistani establishment knows it will be met by a Balakot type response? It has entered Pakistan's calculus that any terrorist attack will not be cost-free. The cost would be that India would escalate. Now, any future Bal uh, Pulwama will have a Balakot plus. Now, whether that means that there will never be an incident, uh, you, you can't uh, make that assumption. But you can certainly make that assumption that the message has gone loud and clear and entered Pakistan security calculus that this is no longer a low cost um, uh, proxy warfare means. There will be a cost that will have to be paid. There will be a risk of escalation. And I argue that uh, India's uh, threshold of response should be ambiguous. That Pakistan does not know when India will respond, whether it will be with a Pulwama sized incident or if three people are killed. Right. That, that brings us then to the, the next chapter, which of course also saw you being um, expelled from Pakistan in, in, in very interesting circumstances, which was of course Article 370. Um, 
tell us about that in your own words because you were observing all of those events taking place from in Pakistan, which was an interesting place to watch it from. Yes, so you know, I, I often say the most um, uh, perhaps interesting three days I spent in Pakistan was just before I was booted out. So uh, that was uh, a fun time. Uh, you know, when India took that decision on uh, 5th of August 2019, uh, Pakistan went into a good deal of panic because it was not something anticipated. And uh, I was summoned for a conversation uh, with the Foreign Office that day. Um, and uh, the Foreign Secretary had, uh, Pakistan's Foreign Secretary had summoned me and he read out this whole uh, uh, accusatory note about how uh, India had sieged Kashmir. And um, I had to push back at the meeting and say that there's nothing India did to change the borders and it was uh, a completely legal process in India's uh, parliament. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it was obviously a very hard meeting and uh, the message that went out was that uh, uh, in, uh, Pakistan was very upset with what India had done. But on, I was not asked to leave on that day. It was later that uh, Pakistan started debating options and realized they did not have any military options like in the past of, uh, of uh, attacking Kashmir or trying to change the status quo. It only had diplomatic options. And then in parliament they said that, uh, uh, you know, what is the Indian High Commission doing here? What is the Indian High Commissioner doing there? One of them even said he's a nice guy, but he represents a fascist government, so he should get out of here. So that's when it became clear that, you know, something is going to be done. And sure enough, then one of my colleagues was summoned and told that I had 72 hours to leave uh, the country. And uh, so in, in, a, in a larger strategic sense, it was the least disruptive choice that Pakistan could make. You know, it could have broken diplomatic relations, it could have uh, shut the embassy, it should have, uh, could have declared war, uh, but it did none of those. It just asked uh, India to downgrade the relationship from the high commissioner level to a CDA level. And, and I think it was basically a, uh, also a, a kind of uh, s uh, expression of panic because it wasn't clear what uh, could be done uh, in that situation, but something had to be done. So Pakistan, in a sense, became a victim of its own hype and overreaction to that situation. And that uh, was, you know, uh, because of Imran Khan's inexperience in dealing with this situation. You decided to come back via Abu Dhabi instead of coming through Vaga as a sort of returning hero. What was the reason for that? Because many of your tribe uh, were waiting to film me, uh, you know. Uh, Former the, uh, tribe. Uh, yes. <laughs> so Pakistan had, uh, uh, we knew that there were cameras uh, on the Vaga border and the cameras on the Indian border. Pakistan would have liked to have shown the humiliated Indian diplomat leaving and India would have uh, liked to, Indian channels may have wanted to show the a hero uh, coming back. So I wanted to uh, sort of avoid both. So I just quickly took a flight to Abu Dhabi um, while saying that, uh, you know, I might be going via Vaga Atari, which was the normal route. So it was basically to avoid a media spectacle. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Right, let, let, let's look at the present now and the future, and then I'm going to throw it open to questions from, from, from everyone uh, here. If you look at the situation today, would it be fair and correct to say that India's preferred way of dealing with Pakistan is to pretend it doesn't exist? You know, it's a lot of peace, less stress, you don't think about it. It's like, you know, that particularly annoying person of the family whom you don't go and visit for, you know, years altogether. Just ignore Pakistan, it doesn't exist. To, you know, you have other things to think about, other priorities. Uh, ignore it and hope it will go away. Is that the way it is playing itself out right now and is that a sustainable policy? You know, I, I don't think it's really playing uh, that way, uh, but you know, there is a strand of, of opinion that you hear in India which says exactly that. And I, I, my own feeling is that would be a huge error. That would be s strategic neglect, it would be strategic complacence, and I, the analogy I would give you is uh, October 7 and uh, Israel. You know, there was strategic uh, neglect of the Gaza problem, there was strategic compl complacence about it, and there was a feeling that we've got over this problem, let's go deal with the West Bank, let's go deal with Saudi Arabia, let's do the larger deals in West Asia. And uh, the Gaza is not really a problem, but guess what? It was. Uh, 
and I think uh, that uh, would be the error we would make if we say that just ignore this problem, deal with other things. You know, it's like saying that I have a toothache, that's not a big problem, let me worry about my headache, let me worry about uh, all the other body parts, but ignore this toothache. So I think Pakistan still is a country with which we fought four wars, 250 million people on our side, hostile country. Uh, it is important uh, to engage with the problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I advocate a two-track strategy, uh, one which we've already discussed of active defense, which means, uh, uh, you know, actively countering terrorism, delegitimizing terrorism globally and treating it as a security relationship in that sense. But along with the policy of calibrated and flexible engagement, so now is not a good time uh, to engage with Pakistan until it has a coherent leadership. But once it has a coherent uh, leadership, and uh, I really mean the army leadership, and the uh, army has a civilian face, that is the time to engage with Pakistan, if for nothing else to consolidate the gains of the last few years. The fact that we haven't gone, uh, had a major spectacular terrorist attack, the fact that a ceasefire at the border has held for four years, five years without major attack, significant drops in terrorism. Let's consolidate those gains by engaging with Pakistan, and critical to that engagement is engaging with the Pakistani army. So when you look at the scenarios ahead, I mean, there are two or three possibilities. One, a very strong Pakistan or an arrogant Pakistan, you know, like in the 60s, obviously not good news because, you know, who knows what they do. Um, then you have the sort of a scenario where Pakistan is strung, struggling and muddling along as it is right now, which may well continue for a period of time. A third is a catastrophic collapse in, in Pakistan, a very, very weak Pakistan, which is broken up into, into many different countries. What is the ideal or the best solution for India, the best option? You know, I, I, I would respond by saying that India needs to deal with Pakistan as it is and not as it should be. And, you know, you might frame one or the other as an ideal or more suitable uh, scenario. But I think we have to war game each of these and be prepared for each of these because it's a very unstable Pakistan which could conceivably go in any direction. And, you know, this poly crisis that Pakistan is going through, at least from 2021, is perhaps one of the most serious it has faced. And the economic crisis is serious because now, uh, it is the accumulated errors of the past 70 years that have come home to roost. Pakistan didn't do any of the reforms that India did, whether land reforms or economic reforms or structural reforms. And all that is adding up. So an, an economy and a country that is uh, collapsing and uh, a very unstable Pakistan, I think, is certainly uh, bad news uh, for India. And uh, basically, I think what uh, we ought to do is uh, engage with, the, with Pakistan whichever way it is, uh, when the time is right in a calibrated way, and uh, maximize the benefit at least of the security challenges uh, not uh, coming anymore from Pakistan. So the power gap between India and Pakistan has perhaps been never as sharp and as acute as it is right now whether it is in diplomatic terms, whether it is in stature on the, on the global stage, whether it is in you know, military terms, economic terms, growth rate terms, future terms, technological terms, sporting terms. I mean, frankly, there's no comparison anymore. All of these things were comparable till a certain period of time. So is there a moment when you think that in that position of strength, India says, all right, fine, we'll have to do something to deal with Pakistan because you also don't want to completely failed state, which perhaps is a Chinese vassal, because who knows what, what that could lead to. Absolutely. I, I think the onus is on Pakistan. As you said, there is an 11x uh, differential in, in GDP, in military power, in comprehensive national power and capacity. And if you see some of the conversations, even in Pakistan on social media, it all sort of comes out. There is a grudging admiration of where India is. And in a country where 50% of the people are under 30, the aspirations are sort of similar. So I think the sense, uh, even in Pakistan, is of uh, an India which is uh, way ahead. And uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, recommendation 
uh, and the instinct of the army, I feel, uh, in, in the uh, short term at least, will be to try and move towards what they call geo-economics, but dealing with India in that fashion. So I, I think India has the ability to be patient, but uh, I would still look at um, 2024 with uh, cautious optimism because uh, elections in Pakistan, a government in place, however flawed the process, there is a government in place. Elections in India, second and the second half of the year, therefore should be a, a good time uh, to, uh, to think of, to do some fresh thinking on the way Pakistan is. All right, Ambassador Basari, let me just see, throw it open and see who has questions. Yeah, the lady there. Yeah, you know, neighborhood first has been a policy, not just now, but for a while, from the 90s, we've had various avatars of this policy. And I think it is, uh, India had pushed also the SARC and so on. The attempt is certainly to, uh, for India to uh, move ahead with the neighborhood as the larger neighbor. But what tends to happen, given the Pakistan's completely abnormal behavior, is that it becomes neighborhood minus one, you know. And uh, that, I think, onus is on Pakistan to get out of that minus one. And uh, if I was advising uh, Pakistan today, I would say that they need to um, benefit from India's rise and, and reach out. So uh, a normalizing Pakistan, which tries to benefit from India's neighborhood first policy is, would be a smart choice for Pakistan. But that means stop terrorism and stop violence. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yes, please. please do. You know, I, I take your point that um, no, not even one death is uh, valid or acceptable, you know, and we talk of a zero tolerance to terrorism. But we have to compare uh, what we faced with what it is now. So if you see the numbers of uh, terrorist deaths or terrorist incidents, there is a relative improvement. It, can it get better? Should it get better? Yes, of course. And how will it get better? Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the question there is, will it get better by kinetic action and uh, military action, or will it be get a, get, getting better by smart policy which includes kinetic action and engagement in, in persuading? So I think we have to uh, have elements of both in achieving uh, uh, precisely the objective you talk about of having zero, uh, zero deaths and zero terrorism. All right. Yeah, the gentleman here. Yeah, please. I have got a question. You mentioned that India never used the kinetic force in dealing with uh, some conventional war which uh, Pakistan was waging against India. But people say that, and fact also, that India was also everything, MGM also. And there is a, uh, there is a large uh, factor. Uh, what would you say that India was funding the you know, uh, so I, when I talk of kinetic force, I'm talking of military to military action, right? Uh, Subconventional military action, either uh, punitive or, uh, or preemptive. Uh, we are not talking of uh, covert strategies and diplomatic strategies of engagement with various uh, other organizations. That, uh, that goes on and that's part of the, uh, the engagement and of dealing with Pakistan. So we haven't really talked about 
uh, the uh, the covert activities uh, that may be required to be done. But uh, when I'm talking of kinetic action, st overtly stated kinetic action that, uh, you know, there is a danger of a terrorist attack, I've done a surgical strike. There is a danger of a terrorist attack, I've done an airstrike. That is new in India's vocabulary. Thank you, sir. I, I think uh, what Mr. Dua has raised for people who didn't hear this, uh, I think are three basic issues. Who are, you know, they go to the heart of the policy dilemma. Uh, do we, who do we engage with the army or the civilians? Uh, do we engage with the uh, people of Pakistan? And the third issue you talked about was, is trade. Do we trade with Pakistan as a generous uh, larger neighbor? So I, I think, you know, these dilemmas we've always had about uh, Pakistan. And what I advocate certainly is to recognize the reality of Pakistan and deal with its army overtly, covertly, silently, with, uh, along with uh, dealing with the civilians or otherwise. But uh, we need to have a continuous dialogue with the main power structure of Pakistan, uh, which is the army. At, you know, uh, when, when Vajpayee went in 99 in his Lahore bus yatra, the error I think we made was that we didn't have the uh, okay of uh, Musharraf, who launched Kargil soon after. And similarly, when uh, PM Modi went in 2015, uh, we immediately, uh, you know, had uh, the attack in Pathan Court. So I would say that learning from all this, some way of uh, having a channel always open with the army uh, to be sure that we triangulate what the civilians are saying with the army. On on trade, um, again, uh, the step was taken from Pakistan's side of banning trade, despite the hurt it causes them to the textile and pharmaceutical industry. So again, this is something India had unilaterally given them uh, the WTO MFN status in 1996, and didn't get reciprocated for all this while. 
but uh, i think uh, trade is a low hanging fruit when relations get better right now pakistan after article 370 had had stopped all trade and also i think what you said about dealing with the people i you know uh, in, in a lot of uh, some former high commissioners have said for instance india has to have multiple pakistan policies we have to be dealing with the different pakistans and uh, the the people to people certainly is an important element of it but uh, the uh, the pain that we face from pakistan doesn't come from its people it comes from its establishment you know that may be 3% of pakistan's population but but that is the one that inflicts pain and that is what we need to address primarily but given i think for the future given this new composition this young pakistan uh, we uh, our diplomacy certainly has to have a strong people to people element as well all right we nearly are attend the gentleman there and then i think uh, mr kurishi wanted to say something you know globally people have a very low bar of democracy for pakistan so everyone will accept everyone globally in if you see all global commentary and coming from pakistan everyone knows this was a fake election this was a rigged election this is a stolen mandate the mandate should have gone to the pti it should have won but the army decided to give it to the um, other uh, weak coalition um, but the fact remains that everyone finds it convenient to go along with it so china will not be critical uh, the us will not be critical they will come around and accept this outcome and they will even get the imf loan notwithstanding uh, imran khan's letter to the imf that please do an audit of our election before you give uh, the uh, loans so the world uh, has been dealing with flawed uh, democracy in pakistan all along so it will not be shedding tears over this uh, diplomacy and uh, i i did mention that i feel that the relationship can get better in the second half of the year. all right i think we are out of time i think kureishi sahab had a, had something to say <laughs> yeah you know so so i think this is a very interesting point you raise about elections um that election to the naked eye was uh, fair uh, but i would say the election day which you saw was fair uh, the election night as we know from data now where the rts the result transmission system mysteriously uh, for five hours uh, went uh, on the blink so, but you know if you had gone this time if you were there on the 8th of february i think your assessment would have been different because it was a different election uh, 
because in Pakistan's management of elections, there are three phases. The pre-election heavy engineering, election day rigging, and then post-election management. So, uh, in 2018, I think the pre-election heavy engineering was enough to get Nawaz in jail and to get Imran the votes. Uh, so, election day, they didn't really have to do too much, so it was a reasonably fair election on election day. But this time, there was all, the one, people voted one way on the 8th of February, but between that Form 45 of what the RTO gives, the returning officer gives, and Form 47, the whole election was transformed and the votes were given in another direction. So, it was heavy pre-election engineering, not enough. Heavy voting day rigging, not enough, and then some post-election uh, management, which will get them the outcome they want, and still the uh, pest they consider Imran Khan won't go away. Ambassador Bissaria, thank you so much. We are flat out of time, but thank you so much. Thank for you. That.